here we are at the Temple of Edfu, one of my favorite places on earth. Um, there are, uh, the, the walls are covered with something called the building texts. Uh, the Greeks found them in this array, in bits and pieces, and they literally put the uh, information on the walls. It's a massive library in stone. And uh, they talk about how after the partial destruction of the island of the gods, the homeland of the gods, the gods established a presence along the Nile. And the story coincides with the younger Dryas after 10,800 BC. Now, this is a funny thing, because when these gods apparently uh, appear after the first, uh, first uh, ice age, and they're looking for somewhere else to live because their sea levels are rising and they have to find new places to live. Well, they, be, they, they began to leave their homeland somewhere around the world, around 10,800 BC, and they settled in Egypt. And the funny thing is that their arrival coincides with an agricultural revolution along the Nile in 10,500 BC. It's an anomaly. And the only way it could have happened is, that, is if someone had imported agriculture to the area. So there is a correlation here in terms of uh, archaeology and also mythology. The sad part of the story is that within 800 years of the arrival of the gods in Egypt, a second disaster sank their island nation pretty much for good. Whereupon uh, the surviving groups of gods who were lucky enough to find themselves in the middle of the ocean and not be overwhelmed by these titanic waves returned to Egypt to, and I quote, rebuild the former mansions of the gods. And the text also adds other, uh, other islands to the uh, litany of islands from where they came from. One of them is called Iutiti, which is, it kind of means the island of beauty. And I wondered, is this their reference to Titicaca and the temple of Tiwanaku? Um, don't know, but it's the uh, etymological connection is certainly there. What is there is the fact that the gods of Egypt were called the Aku Shemsu Hor, which translates as shining ones followers of Horus. So in other words, these gods are exactly the same people as Viracocha and company, and the gods of Egypt also arrive in groups of seven with one charismatic leader. So we now have an overlap with all of these stories. And they too are described as light-skinned between eight and a half and ten feet tall with red hair and elongated skulls. Uh, they're often described as uh, the builder gods because they came back to Egypt to build the mansions of the gods. Well, that was the first question I wanted to ask myself. What might they have been building? Well, the building texts commemorate their arrival as the first occasion, and the date is commemorated in the alignment of the Giza pyramids at 10,400 BC on the spring equinox, uh, along with the pyramids of that show, by the way. Uh, but there's at least one site that I believe may even be older, and it's right here. It's called the Osirian, uh, from which I just came, come back from, by the way, uh, leading a very happy and successful tour. Uh, I wasn't going to show the suntan, but I'm sorry, we're live. Well, this is a, uh, a, a kind of a rebuilding of the diagram of uh, what the Osirian used to look like. Uh, it, was, uh, it was once considered an underground temple and still is by most uh, mainstream academia. There's only one problem with this theory. That is that the temple was actually um, an underground because of the accumulation of silt around its walls, 40 to 50 feet of silt. And that accumulation of silt is only consistent when the Nile Valley was much wetter, which is the period between 10,500 BC and 8,000 BC, which created major flooding and of course led to major silt deposits. So that means that the temple had to have been there before the silting began. So it puts us in a time period around 8,000 BC. Then in 1300 BC, uh, Seti I builds his temple adjacent to it above the ground. Uh, it's a beautiful temple. Uh, it bears absolutely no relationship architecturally to the one below, uh, but it does share the same axis as the Osirian. So in other words, Seti must have rediscovered uh, the, uh, the Osirian because he couldn't just place his temple on the same axis by accident unless he was exceptionally um, psychic. Well, his temple stops just short of the Osirian and then bends to the left, which is a complete contradiction of temple design because what he's doing here, he is divorcing the Holy of Holies, which is the head of the body, sorry, the head of the temple from the body of the temple. 
that just doesn't happen in Egyptian temple building. Uh, and Sefi was a very astute uh, student of the mysteries. He would have known better to do that. So my theory is that Seti may have rediscovered the Assyrian, which by his time was already underground, and then he tried to build his temple on top. And then the weight of this temple collapsed the ceiling of the Assyrian, which probably was already compromised due to the exceptional earthquakes in this region. Well, now we have to ask ourselves exactly how old is the Assyrian? Well, let's look at the, uh, the name. Uh, it's named for Osiris, and the, uh, who is the embodiment of the constellation of Orion. And yet neither the Assyrian nor Seti's temple faces Orion in the past 15,000 years. Now, that was a big surprise to me. I thought that this would be a very easy kind of thing to figure out. So it took a couple of, time, uh, a couple of years to go back to Seti's temple looking for clues, and he left one clue in the last chamber, right at the, uh, the very corner of the room, the very place where most people don't bother to look. And of course, if you're an astute observer of the mysteries, you follow the clue to its least possible destination because that's where you find all the gold. So here it is. It's a panel, uh, beautifully carved uh, on the wall. And uh, it's actually in uh, uh, the chapel number eight in, uh, the, Osir uh, in the, uh, uh, Seti's temple. And the panel depicts Osiris's consort Isis as the hawk of Osiris. And her outstretched wings demonstrate the ability to fan the breath of immortality into Osiris. But for this to occur, the soul of the hero must reside in the region of regeneration, which is the pole star, which is protected by seven circumpolar stars called the indestructibles. So perhaps we should be looking for a whole constellation instead of Orion in relation to the Osirian. Well, back in 10,500 BC, the star Deneb was one of those indestructible stars. And Deneb is the brightest star in the constellation of Cygnus. But Cygnus was not regarded as, as a swan back in the day. It was regarded as a hawk. And therein lies the connection with Osiris, the woman who resurrects her soul, and the archaeoastronomical date when the Osirian was most likely built. Not bad for 15 years of work, I say. Well, Let's look at the epoch before the flood. Uh, on the winter solstice and um, in the spring of 10,500 BC, uh, there's a perfect match. The, uh, actually, I've just repeated myself. It's okay. I've got a bit of jet lag. Uh, if you're standing on the, um, in the middle of the Assyrian back in the spring equinox of 10,500 BC, there, you would have seen a perfect match between the temple and the sky because Cygnus, the hawk, appears to ascend upright along a vertical Milky Way. So literally, it's floating on a river towards a pole. That's an incredible theatrical moment. But the best part is that the star Deneb would have been perfectly framed by the actual entrance. Uh, and in case you're uh, paying attention, uh, the photograph shows the rear of the temple because it makes it easier to demonstrate what I'm talking about. So this wonderful connection of the Milky Way as a vertical ladder and the, uh, the hawk rising vertically through the front door with the star Deneb would have made a fantastic sight. And it would have not been missed and lost on people for whom the sky, sky and ground relationship was very, very important. So we now have the shining ones present before and after the flood in both Egypt and the Andes and also the Pacific. Uh, these groups are described as master seafarers and astronomers, and they share identical megalithic building me methods. And in turn, Vidakosha and his shining ones resemble the Urukeu of New Zealand and Easter Island. They are the same red-haired, light-skinned seafaring astronomers who employ identical building methods throughout the Pacific. And as for the Urukeu, they may be the same as the followers of Horus because both of their leaders were red-haired navigators and astronomers and both held the title net of the world for their ability to map the rearranged lands after the flood. And here they are depicted on the panel of the Temple of Edfu, uh, at least, what, four and a half thousand miles away from New Zealand? And all of the three uh, gods, uh, groups of gods, share another point in common 
they are all associated with Orion. So I posit that these are probably the same people, the same brother and sisterhood, and they may have lived in different parts of the world. So now the question is, could they have also been present in the Atlantic Ocean? Well, let's find out. Even if you discount a major subsidence in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, due to damage from meteoric impacts uh, and rising sea levels 11,000 years ago, the Azores were still a formidable archipelago back then. And bathymetric maps of the region even bear some resemblance to the continent depicted on ancient maps, that kind of triangular shape. But also, note, uh, note also that the, uh, in the map, north is pointing south. Now, the Hopi, the Zuni, and the Egyptians all claimed that the Earth's poles were reversed at this point, which is what caused the, la the beginning of the last ice age. So I believe that the, uh, the map may be an echo of traditions that were being uh, pushed around uh, Europe. And at the beginning, I asked, can a land sink in the blink of a geological eye? Well, as recent history shows, yes, it can. But an island the size of a continent? Well, that's something very different, isn't it? Well, perhaps. Rocks that were recovered at a depth of 6,000 feet around the Azores actually show signs of exposure to oxygen, while sediment taken from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge reveals the remains of freshwater plants and beach sand created along a shoreline. Uh, and it indicates that this part of the Atlantic was still above sea level around 15,000 BC before the date of the first of the three cataclysms. So where is the evidence for its pre-flood civilization, I hear you say? Well, here's a funny story for you. Uh, I was actually on my way to Portugal via the Azores, and I landed in the uh, main island just in time for the, um, uh, I was going to say the pub, I'm, talking, I'm thinking of England, for the cafe to open. And uh, the newspapers were being dished out, and uh, in one of the headlines it said, uh, silver discovers underwater pyramid. And I wondered, what the hell was I doing when I was asleep on a plane, I wonder. Of course, it turns out to be a completely different silver. Uh, this was Dio Ciclitano silver, and uh, he found himself a pyramid, a submerged pyramid, 100 uh, foot tall, uh, and it's 180 feet below sea level. And here are the sonar images of what he actually found. Well, the Portuguese Navy investigated his claims and said, silver is mistaken. Well, what a surprise. It's just a seamount. Of course it is. Uh, it's a step pyramid, perfectly aligned to grid north. Uh, it, uh, the nature does incredible things sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, well, it turns out that the Navy actually uh, searched the wrong area and uh, it was pointed out to them, to which point they replied, well, Silver actually had the GPS coordinates completely wrong, which makes you wonder, how did this fisherman ever get home safely 20 years uh, going out fishing in the mid-Atlantic out of sight of the islands with faulty equipment. It does beg a belief, doesn't it? Some of these official explanations, you wish to just quit while they're still ahead. Well, I thought it was very exciting when he discovered this, and perhaps he discovered what I've been looking for all along, because back when I wrote my second book, The Divine Blueprint, I actually laid out a world grip of some of the ancient sites of the world and how they are mathematically positioned around the world. Uh, Graham Hancock, my colleague, also came, with the, uh, came up with the same idea, and uh, we worked independently and reached very similar conclusions. And the one place that was missing was right down the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, because there's nothing there. Well, I thought we'd struck gold, but if you look at where the uh, Azores Pyramid is located, it's actually uh, just a, it's, it's, it's a few degrees off from where it ought to be, where, where the main location ought to be. So if there are any of you uh, amateur sailors watching right now, here are the coordinates, the mathematical coordinates where I propose a major city complex actually is. And if you find it, please send back really good photographs and I'll buy you a bottle of really good scotch. And by the way, if you're very observant, look at that, um, uh, the island of San Miguel, uh, which is the lowest one on the picture, and look at that depression, that circular depression around it. Are we looking here at a massive meteor crater 
or are we dealing here with a sudden caldera? Because the, the uh, islands are very, vo very volcanic. We may have here evidence of a major collapse, either from the sky or from the ground, and it bears a further examination. Well, having said that, whatever happened to the uh, gods of Atlantis? Because this is obviously the place where we should be looking. Well, the traditions at the end of the Younger Dryas describe how one group of gods sailed east after the flood. Uh, they ended up just on the uh, uh, to, to the west of Lisbon, uh, ironically, exactly where I was born, and they were called the off user. They were described, uh, uh, descri actually, they're not described, the name literally means the people of the serpent. So we're talking about the very same gods of Egypt, of South America, and so forth. Uh, meanwhile, on the opposite side of the Atlantic, we have an identical story. Uh, we have groups of sages uh, 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 people arriving in the Yucatan Peninsula, and they were described as migrating from stepping stone to stepping stone from the east on a raft of serpents, uh, which of course is uh, a bit funny when you read that. Uh, were they that desperate to escape a sinking landmass that they would even go into a boat filled with snakes? I don't think that story actually adds up very well. What the, the story is telling you is that the people inside the, the raft or the canoe were serpent people. That makes a lot more sense. And they were hopping literally from island to island because that's all that was remained of their original uh, island, uh, which they called Atl, which of course is the origin of the name uh, Atitlan and then Atlantic. Now in the Chilam Balam, which is the sacred book of the Yucatan, it actually dates this event, 9,600 BC. Uh, which is just within 100 years of when geologists have actually dated the catastrophe of the flood. It's an important date because it is identical to the date given by the Egyptian priest to that visiting Greek scholar called Solon for the sinking of the homeland of the gods. So Plato's story of Atlantis actually is verified by the Chilam Balam on the opposite side of the world. What about these gods? These gods were called Its, which literally means sorcerer, magician, and their title of office, like I said, was the Kanul. It means people of the serpent. And it was also the title given to the people of South America. So at the, at the one stroke, it links the flood gods of Yucatan with South America and also of Mesopotamia, because they had the same uh, title of office there as well. The Its... Uh, were described as architects of the sky. They spoke uh, a language called Hesuyatao, which means the language of light. What a great description. And nothing more is, is known about this language of light. And uh, they arrived in groups of seven, yet again, led by an eight charismatic leader called Itzamna. It's a guy, a god man, who we get to hear very little about. Uh, but he is described as a tall, light-skinned, long-bearded man with very Caucasian features. And here he is on the left, still portrayed on an eroded wall at Chichen Itza. And the same description is given to two other leaders of these canoes who landed in two other parts of the Yucatan. One of them is called Kukulkan, and the other one you'll know very well. His name is Quetzalcoatl, and there he is, the servant person. So these are actually, by the way, not names. They were titles. There were many Quetzalcoatl and many Kukulkan, uh, which of course drives historians absolutely crazy and makes the dating of things for them very, very difficult. But people in the Maya world know very different and they don't really talk to outsiders about it. Well, the Its, these very unusual people, moved across the Yucatan. They established temple cities like Chichen Itza, which bears their name. And then they continued inland and into mountains, far away from the ocean, which is very sensible. And they built the original Tikal, the, the original Ushmal, and the temple cities that reflected the architecture of their homeland, but also of the cosmos. So what you're looking at here is not just a pyramid, it's a library in stone. They described them as astral academies, each building encoded with knowledge of mathematics, science, and astronomy. Information brought from their original homeland and built using huge monuments to ensure the knowledge would survive future cataclysms. And the buildings were rebuilt over and over and over. So what we see today is, for example, is the fifth iteration of the building. There are five other pyramids inside this and many other buildings. So when people say, yeah, this was built in historical times, it's absolutely correct. 
What is not correct is the fact that they are hiding even all the structures, which really gets talked about. So these magician gods, the Itz, continued deeper into the highlands of Guatemala, and they eventually, eventually settled on a lake that they called Atitlan, which was named for the sunken island continent they had once lost. And in the middle, they built the city of Utitlan, which then sank during a massive volcanic eruption. And you'd think after what they'd been through on a volcanic island in the Atlantic, they would have moved somewhere less volatile, but I guess old habits die hard. So they eventually uh, rebuilt Utitlan on the shore of Utitlan, and uh, part of the remains are still there today. Not many, they've all been plundered for uh, uh, local building material. Their other main center, however, does survive quite well, and it's right here. It's uh, called Te Itza, which is actually an Egyptian and a Polynesian name, oddly enough, and it sits on the island of Lake Peten Itza. And again, it was chosen to reflect the, Atl uh, the original Atlantic island home. And the name means the great islands of the Itz. But if you look carefully at the map, it's not a great island at all. There's a much bigger one off to the top left-hand corner. So why is this island, the big island, which is the bigger one next door? Well, it turns out that Te Itza, uh, which is today called Flores, by the way, uh, it was their main spiritual center, and it comprised 21 temples and a big pyramid. And that's what made it big. And its strategic placement, looking down the neck of the lake, is why it was chosen over the large islands. Now, here's how I found this out. Here is the center of Flores today. Um, I reasoned that the Spanish built that church over the original pyramid because it was standard Catholic practice to hide things and use the temples of the ancients as building material. Well, how can we be certain that this is correct? Well, one, because it was Catholic practice to align their churches east to west, uh, except that this church is aligned 132 degrees east-southeast. When that happens, and especially in Europe, it means it's hiding an earlier temple. They don't want you to know it's there. But of course, paradoxically, by not aligning the temple east-west, they are giving the game away. When I mentioned this to the local bishop, I was, ex I was escorted out of the building immediately. And uh, that also told me that I was on the right path of inquiry. And since the church sits on the highest ground, it allows a beautiful view of the horizon down the long neck of the lake. All you have to do now is stand there and take a bead down the lake of the neck and find out, well, what was happening here that made this position so important? What were they looking at at 132 degrees east southeast? Well, when you take a bee down the lake, the only alignment that makes sense is that it's marking the winter solstice sunrise in 7,600 BC. So within a thousand years, the Itz had already moved deep into the mountains of Guatemala. And the Maya do acknowledge their own tradition to be a continuation of the, uh, the traditions founded by the Itz. Uh, the Maya is really a, a name of a, a belief system, not necessarily a people. And the Maya really come into their own as a people in 3100 BC, ironically at the same time that the first pharaoh, and I quote, of a purely human bloodline takes the throne of Egypt. So there is an overlap between the gods of Egypt and uh, the Maya world, even in historical times. Uh, there is a clue that lies in the Maya serpent dynasty because it is said to cover over 16,000 years. In other words, the dynasty of the Maya precedes the flood and it probably began elsewhere in a missing land now in the middle of the Atlantic. Because if you remember correctly, the surviving gods moved to the uh, mainland of the around the world to rebuild the former world of the gods. They were carrying on from where they left off. And in fact, uh, evidence for this is now coming up in the archaeological record as well. Uh, in this picture, you'll see that there's an older age to the Pyramid of Kukulkan at Chichen Itza because uh, the, one of the lower layers have now been discovered. And it was described as being built originally by a serpent priest. And I am told from uh, one of the archaeologists that there, there are still many other layers to go underneath this one. So we'll wait to see what happens. Well, can the Maya dynasty really be that old? Well, let's take a look. Uh, consider that uh, 358 submerged cave systems uh, have been found near the Temple of Tulum on the coast of Yucatan. And they contain the remains of enormous sloths, proto-elephants, extinct fauna, and Maya human remains and artifacts. And they were all trapped in the cave by rising water levels by 8 
thousand BC. So the culture has to precede that time, and it's proving that myths that people lived in this region when the flood struck, and whose survivors witnessed the arrival of the Its from a sunken continent. And these people of the serpent were also present in other parts of the world. Um, in the Far East, for example, there's a wonderful coincidence. Uh, Itzamna, who happens to be the one of the gods of the Yucatan, happens to be a compound name of the two gods who were the builders of civilization of the, around the flood in Japan in 8000 BC, and they're called Itzanami and Itzanagi. And their lineage also encompasses Indochina where they were also known as the dragon bloodline of the Chinese continent and the entire region of Indochina. But they were also active in Polynesia and particularly Fiji. And later, or possibly the same time, we are not certain, also in India, because they were called the Naga people, which means serpent. And all the priests associated with the Naga uh, bloodline were also described as serpent people. So every local tradition describes these heroes emerging from a flood, accompanied by seven sages who instructed humans on civilization. They built megalithic structures and behaved like magicians. And again, they were always light skinned, red haired and green eyed or blonde with blue eyes, very tall and with long beards. The region where all of these stories, people, names and attributes converge is Upper Mesopotamia, where we find a kind of missing land. And it's actually the lost hill of Gobekli Tepe. Sometimes these things uh, in terms of a, an, a, an island of the gods is also a place that behave like an island, a place that's remote from everyone else. So here we are in Gobekli Tepe. Uh, the whole mountain is artificial. They've so far found 53 stone circles. Uh, they've only dug up about six of them and they're gonna be uh, kept very busy for the next 150 years unless they get some volunteers. So if you have nothing better to do, pack your bags off to Northern Turkey. There have been very reliable carbon-14 uh, tests made of the um, organic material at this site. And the average dating is 9,984 BC. So it precedes, most of these circles precede the Great Flood. The problem there is that the samples were taken from the walls. And if you look carefully at the walls of, let's say, structure D, which is its most uh, famous in, uh, structure, <coughs> excuse me, um, you find that these walls are actually obscuring important details on the pillars. So the walls were obviously added much later when the, when the site was decommissioned and very carefully and deliberately buried. So when might these structures themselves have been built? Well, for this, we turn again to the stars to see if we can get an alignment. So let's again concentrate on uh, Enclosure D because it has a lot of decorations and it gives us some clues as to what they may be observing in the sky. It has been suggested that the alignment uh, of, uh, of Gobekli Tepe is to the northern setting of Sirius. It's an elegant uh, idea, but there's a problem because enclosure, uh, the enclosure sits below the summit by 30 feet. There's a great big mound of rock in front of you, which makes it very hard to measure the sky with the hill obstructing your line of vision. And secondly, and most importantly, ancient people rarely, if ever, celebrated the descent of a celestial object. They only celebrated the rising or the midheaven elevation. Uh, so I believe that there's a re-examination is in order. Let's take the earliest carbon-14 date of the site, which is 10,200 BC. Well, now a number of uh, things begin to emerge. Um, if we take the view on the winter solstice of 10,400 BC, uh, yes, we do see sea sickness descending behind the hill. But the only clear view of the north is the path of the pole star and its uh, vega and its elliptical rotation around the celestial pole framed uh, by two, the two T pillars. And those two T, those pillars are pillar 43. Uh, sorry, the two T pillars that stand in the middle of the enclosure. And uh, pillar 43 actually marks the starting point of Vega's observation from that location. So there is an actual way you can actually see the pole star at the time using this basic observational technique. And this is the pillar where you'll find the uh, carving of vultures revolving around a circle. Now, 
Vega, uh, the name comes from the word wacky, which means falling or swooping. And it refers to the motion of its host constellation Lyra resembling a swooping vulture. So it appears that the pillar is accurately depicting the behavior of Vega and Lyra around the celestial pole. The only clear sight line of the enclosure when you actually stand there is actually to the southeast. And when you do this, when Vega is visible behind you in the north, if you're looking to the southeast, the belt of Orion rises briefly above the horizon for the first time. Its narrow arc framed by pillars 19 and 32, with pillar 33 marking its highest ascension. So we have here a very good, uh, uh, I'd say a very uh, solid foundation for archaeoastronomy at Gobekli Tepe. Um, this reference raises an important issue, too, because specifically with regard to Giza, where the same relationship takes place on the very same date. Well, what is the connection between Gobekli Tepe and Giza, which is about, uh, to my, I believe it's about 800 miles to the south? Well, this is where the understanding of place names comes in really, really useful, because, you know, back in the day, objects and people were given names that embodied an event or a function that defined their purpose. So it would be remembered by future generations. They didn't just hand out names because they felt like it. Well, let's take a look at Gobekli Tepe. It is not the original name of the mountain. The original name is an Armenian word called Portasar. And Port is very easy to understand. It means umbilical cord or navel. Asar is a bit of a more of a problem. It's actually not Armenian at all. It's uh, the Egyptian name for Osiris. Uh, Osiris is a, is a Greek transliteration of Asad. So now we can say that Gobekli Tepe means the umbilical cord of Osiris. Why would uh, the umbilical cord of Osiris be in this part of Upper Mesopotamia? I wonder. Well. If you look at Osiris himself, he, of course, is the earthly embodiment of Orion, and his dwelling place is said to be the Giza Plateau. So there is a suggestion here in the name that Gobekli Tepe and Giza are somehow linked by some kind of invisible umbilical cord. So is this what the umbilical cord is referring to? Uh, when you draw a cord from the corner of the pyramid of Menkaure through to the corner of the pyramid of Khufu, you end up at Gobekli Tepe. So th this is Gobekli Tepe is now the second dwelling place of Osiris. There is a figurative umbilical cord between the two sites. So it, in other words, there's a geodetic link between these two locations. The two are somehow related in a way we still don't quite understand. It's a work in progress. Thank you.